This is a Hot Pie Media Original. There's a song called Drowning, which is an encapsulation of depression that is just so powerful. And that's where I was. I was, you know, on the mat and didn't think I could get up. And Muhammad Ali knew what that felt like and kept sort of encouraging me to get up. Like, kid, you gotta get up, kid, you gotta get up. And when he knew I was ready, he said, you don't wanna go through life as the woman who almost rode across the ocean. Hi, I'm Eric Corum, and this is The Blueprint. I've spent my life helping Olympic gold medalists, NFL and NCAA athletes be the best at their craft. Now I'm taking that experience and translating it into your life. This podcast is for busy professionals and household CEOs who care deeply about their family, career, and their health. There's an ocean of content to wade through, but I do the heavy lifting for you and distill cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your lifestyle and goals. Tori Merton McClure is a scholar, acclaimed author, and a -a one-of-a-kind athlete. Tori holds four degrees, a BS in psychology, a master's in divinity from Harvard, a law degree from the University of Louisville, and a master's of fine arts in writing from Spalding University, where she is currently the president. Tori is the first American to solo row across the Atlantic Ocean, the first female and the first American to ski to the geographic South Pole, and she is the claimed author of A Pearl in the Storm, How I Found My Heart in the Middle of the Ocean. In this episode, we discuss slaying your internal dragons, the spirit of adventure, and living a life of service. If you enjoy listening to The Blueprint, please take a moment and smash the follow button on whatever platform you're listening on. And if you are a frequent listener of the podcast, please leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app. This will help us reach more people with the message of The Blueprint. But before we get to my interview with Tori, in 2020... I left an over 15-year career in the NFL and NCAA sports to start a company called AIM7. I wanted to use my expertise in wearable technology to move past unscientific recommendations like walking 10,000 steps a day and deliver real solutions to help people improve their health and well-being. AIM7 is an app that uses health data from wearable devices like the Apple Watch and Aura Ring to create small, scientific, personalized recommendations to help you sleep better, increase your energy, reduce your stress, or lose weight. If you are a busy person that needs a simple solution for your health and wellness, then AIM7 is for you and it's free. If you're ready to finally unlock the power of your wearable data, then go to www.aim7.com. That is AIM7.com to get early and free access to our exclusive program. AIM7 starts small and starts with you. Your health data your values to get to your thriving life. We're so grateful to the Blueprint's title sponsor, The Festive Kitchen. The zany creators at The Festive Kitchen set out to create the perfect sweet, salty, crunchy snack with just a little heat. After attempting numerous flavor combinations, they started sharing samples with family and friends who would ask, what is the name of this snack? Since there was no name, they answered, I don't know, but it's freaking awesome. Hilariously, the name stuck and a new product was born. It's a snack and it's freaking addicting called It's Freaking Awesome. You can order online now at shop.festivekitchen.com and itsfreakingawesome.com. Trust me, this snack is as cool as it sounds. Brace yourself. You'll be ordering frequently for your monthly freaking fix. The good news is they now have a freaking monthly subscription. Again, it's available at shop.festivekitchen.com and itsfreakingawesome.com. That's I-T-S-F-R-E-A-K-I-N awesome.com. But now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Thank you for joining me today. I'm super excited to have you on the podcast. Uh, Tori, your book, A Pearl in the Storm, is just masterfully written. Oh, thank you. Yes. I worked worked hard on it. Oh, I could tell. I mean, I was sucked in from the first page, literally. And you know what I appreciated about this book is like you weaved your personal story into this journey across the ocean in a very fluid manner. And for the listeners who may not be fully acquainted with your story, like you, you rode across, you were the first American to solo row across the Atlantic Ocean. But this was not your first, I'm going to call it physical feat of accomplishment. You're an avid outdoors person. 
You've hiked in some of the mountains all over the world, including Kenya. You were the first American and the first woman to ski 750 miles to the geographic South Pole, all for your, I mean, you said it was for your, um, my thesis, your thesis on the theology of adventure, which I think is crazy. Where does this spirit of adventure come from? You know, um, they did a great job kind of synthesizing that when they, when they worked on this musical called Row. Mm -hmm. It's based on my book. Um, but the only reason to write a book, unless you're bragging is, is to explain the why. And, and I, you know, I would bristle at that question because, um, you don't ask, you know, a doctor, why, why do you want to cure cancer? You don't, if you agree with some, with what someone's doing, you don't ask them why they did it mm -hmm. uh, or why they are going to do it. And so the, to explain the why is a, a more intricate thing, but I, I, kept writing this bad book over and over and over again. And you can't spend two and a half months alone in a rowboat if you're not an introvert. So um, the idea of writing a book about myself was really kind of off-putting. So I kept writing this book about a rowboat rowing itself alone across the ocean. <laughs> and it was bad. Mm. And when I started to write about the people who stood at the forks in the road of my life. I mean, I mean Muhammad Ali at, at a fork in the road of your life is a pretty cool thing. No question. But, but as I started to write about the teachers and the mentors and the coaches who changed my journey, then it became a story that was worth telling. But the real pivotal elements are, you know, I was this scrappy little kid. Uh, I grew up with a brother who has intellectual disabilities. We moved a lot when I was growing up. And so we were always the new kids on the block and we were always getting bullied and beaten and, and bad things happening to us. And I always thought if I could just be bigger and smarter and stronger and faster, I could stop these bad things from happening. And, and civilization, from my point of view, was evil and bad and uh, where you got beaten and the wilderness was safe and comfortable. And, uh, you know, storms might happen, but it didn't feel personal. Mm. And so that um, willingness to take kind of the burnout job, trying to change the world as it is, I would heal by going out into the wilderness. And when I decided to ski to the South Pole, I was working at Boston City Hospital, where 95% of the patients were uninsured. Someone would vomit in a hallway and it would be there for three weeks. It, it literally got shut down for health code violations shortly after I worked there. and. It was, it was in some ways soul destroying to work in that environment, but that's where the need was. So that's where I wanted to be. But I skied to the South Pole kind of to heal and to write this, this um, thesis, which balanced at that time what I thought of as the backcountry adventure with what I believe still today to be the more important urban adventure. Hmm. You know, my, my work here at Spalding University in Louisville, Kentucky is an urban adventure. It's, it's fighting the good fight uphill. Uh, it's, you know, it's August or September, so I can't talk about snow, but yeah, yeah. I lived in Kentucky, so there is some snow, but I was not going to ask you why, because I read the <laughs> book and there's a pivotal moment to me in the book. There's multiple times where you're like, people would ask me why. And I'm like, just, you would growl at them almost. And when Muhammad, you, you and Muhammad Ali had this moment and you're like, did anybody, did you ever ask yourself why you were in the ring? Yeah. And I thought that was so brilliant because uh, you probably got sick of that question. Yeah. What was interesting is, is Muhammad didn't ask why he asked, were there times out there right. you wondered, why am I here? And that's a, that's a, a subtly different question because mm -hmm. Muhammad understood the why in that sort of driven kind of unhappy with the world as it is kind of being, he understood that, but you know, were there times out there you wondered, why am I here? And absolutely. There Especially were when you were there. getting flipped over and about yeah. to die. Yeah. 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 I want to ask you something that was not touched on in the book. Okay. Cause like you talk about your family, you talk about your story and then like you talk about building the boat twice um, but you never talked about how you prepared. No, cause, cause, cause as I was working on the book, there, there are all these challenges that a woman has in writing a book like this. The, the hero's journey is a classically male story, right? There's the, there's the call to adventure. There's the preparation. There's the, you know, six chapters of 
repairing and building and whatnot. And I just, I didn't want to, I wanted to, I wanted to, um, uh, claim the hero's journey for myself, but I didn't want to do it in that sort of very structured kind of way. And so building the boat was a, a, a whole book in, in and of itself. Um, there aren't a lot of books about how to build an ocean going rowboat. And ultimately I just had to decide to go ahead and do it. I didn't design it. It was designed by a British fellow, Philip Morrison. So it was really just the physical building of it that I had to do. Um, but building it was a huge advantage when I got hit by a hurricane and st- things started to fall apart. Um, so that notion of knowing how to fix what's broken is you is really fixed exciting. so many things. I loved how you would only fix things on Sunday. Like right. you would like something would break and you're like, I can't stop. I'm going to fix it on Sunday. Um, but I do want to ask you physically your training. How long did you prepare physically? Were there psychological things you were doing to prepare yourself for this? Or did you just like, I don't, what did you do? Yeah. So I tried out for the Olympic team in 92. So I trained very much as I would have trained to, to be a competitive athlete, you know, six, seven hours a day. Um, you know, all the lifting, all the rowing, all the, mm-hmm. the things you would imagine. And I think what one of the real advantages I have, I don't physically rowing across the ocean is not that difficult. I think a lot, lots of folks can and, and are doing it now. The, um, the challenge is the solitude and being an introvert, I had an advantage there. But all the sort of education you see behind me was was the mental preparation of I could always think of somebody who had it worse than I did. You know, there was mm. one point where I was rationing food because I thought I was going to run out. And I was like, well, Magellan's crew had to eat the leather out of the rigging to make it <laughs> make it through. I'm not eating the leather. Yeah. You're eating cliff bars and granola. Yeah. I love the stories about like you're you're like upset with because you wanted chocolate and peanut butter cliff bars and you got some fruit cliff bar in there. I could just those are the types of things that just that made this story. Just the little the little details that you threw in were phenomenal and how you were able to go back and forth and you remembered such great detail and how you put kind of things, questions you would ask yourself in italics. But there was a moment, I believe it was on July 4th where you had a tough day of rowing and this wave, I just loved your honesty. This wave just caught you, right? You weren't expecting it just smacked right into you and you wanted to get angry and you wanted to basically curse this wave, but you realized that you had control over your attitude. What did you learn through that? That's kind of helped you now about how can you respond to adversity? Yeah, I you know there are a lot, one of the books that comes to mind when when you talk about choosing one's attitude is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, and Viktor Frankl was a um, psychoanalyst who spent time in a, con- a Nazi concentration camp, and and he talks about like you can't there are all sorts of things you can't control, but you can control your attitude. And for me, I would let the headwinds would get in my head and I would really let the fact the wind was blowing in the wrong direction just destroy my day. And that's a choice that I was making. And and we don't have to make that choice. Get a flat tire on the way to work. It be it can be a grand adventure of how do I fix the tire on the way to work? Or I can let it ruin my whole week. And and we have a choice uh, in attitude. And obviously, you're an expert in, in that sort of uh, decision making. Well, I just thought that that was such a great thing to point out because we do have control. And I talk to my kids about this all the time. You know, I have three boys and sometimes they wake up in the morning and they're just not happy because they, you know, they're up early. I'm like, listen, you have a decision to make right now, right? Like it's your, you you have control over your attitude. I think uh, Chuck Swindoll has that great statement about attitude if you ever want to read it. But um, I just, I just thought that was a really good point that you made. Why did you name your boat the American Pearl? Pearls are jewelry that I, men don't typically wear pearls. Minor hanging out here. Um, uh, uh, and I started to wear pearls after I spent a summer in Kenya with a Maasai. And there was this moment when um, my, my, I traveled 
primarily with two Maasai, one named Moses, the other named Daniel. Yes, the Christian missionaries had been in that part of Kenya. <laughs> um, but Moses got tangled up by his beads in an acacia tree, which have all these, you know, uh, thorns. And stupid white person that I was, I thought I'd go in and help him get out. And I got tangled up. And and in the midst of us sort of laughing and wrestling with the tree and trying to get untangled, he, I said, Moses, what's up with the beads? Because <laughs> he had all sorts of beads. And he goes, I, 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 I. Each bead represents a friend. And so when I came home, I started to wear um, kind of colored colored beads that eventually settled into, into pearls. And uh, they're, my, they're my uniform. Um, they're, most of them that I wear are not real because I tend to launch them with sunglasses or masks. And <laughs> I literally had a pearl bounce across the parking lot into a storm drain. So oh. a pearl in the storm drain uh, was, a, was a new thing for me. But And then um, from the United States. And... I'm fairly, it's hard right now to feel patriotic, um, but I feel very lucky having been born where I was born and have the access to education that I've had. Hmm. You know, if you think about a pearl and how it's created. But yeah. The other story I typically tell yeah. is a pearl is um, created when a grain of sand works its way into an oyster. And if you work at it and work at it, it can become a pearl mm -hmm. in that sense of a dream is like a grain of sand that works its way into you. And if you work at it, it can become a pearl. And those people in your life who make a difference and stand at the forks of the road in your life, they're, they're the pearls in your life as well. Yeah. Cause I mean, your book says how I found my heart in the middle of the ocean and I mean, you went through some refining. I mean, I did some I did. serious refinement. Um, the interesting thing to me too was most of your book is about a quote. I'm going to quote put this in quotes, like a failure. You know, the the first yeah. attempt. Which yeah. eighty days into this thing, roughly three thousand miles road, you get hit by a hurricane. Yep. Okay. You didn't have communication early on. I can't remember what happened, but like your radio or whatever it was, yeah. like stopped working. It got wet, whatever. And so you didn't really have advance warning. No, I just knew the weather was weird. Yeah. And you're mapping this thing out in in the 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 hatch essentially this <laughs> the moisture the con condensation in the cabin i'm i'm drawing maps of storms and trying to figure out what's going on yeah and you realize this is not going to be good no it's gonna um be good. Yeah. you want to talk about like i hate to ask you this but like you got beat to a pulp in this thing I what did. was that like and um so each I capsized, oh, at least a dozen times. And, and there's no way for me to know for sure how many times I capsized. But, you know, many of my capsizes were sort of side over side, but a number of them were end over end pitch poles. Uh, one capsize dislocated my shoulder. The next capsize put it back into place. Each capsize is like a car crash. Mm. And, um, and I counted each episode as one capsize, even though the bolt, you, there's no way to know how many times the ceiling went by as you're rolling around in the, in the cabin and, and to call it a cabin is to sort of glorify the, <laughs> the size. It was kind of a double wide coffin, but you're still slamming pretty hard into ceilings and floors and walls as, as the boat's rolling. And, and when it's going end over end, my six foot frame is getting compressed into these, you know, tiny little corners. Um, the physical damage from the hurricane uh, I'm old enough now to, to feel it every day. Oh. Um, but it was the psychological damage of it's not, it's not quick, right? Most times when, uh, someone's afraid in the wilderness, it's a, a bear encounter or a, a fall on a climb. And it's, you know, it's, it's pretty fast and, and, you know, pretty quickly what's going to happen and, and you can deal with the aftermath. But in a, in a storm like that, it went on for a, a full day and actually extended beyond that as you're getting out of these really violent waves. Um, and so that sense of when is this going to end? And one of the passages in my book that I really wrestled with, whether I was going to, you know, there's no story in the book that I had to tell you. Right. And if, and if, if, if I didn't write it down, it never happened. Um, but there's the point in Hurricane Danielle when I go out intending to set off my distress beacon and decide not to. And in that I've, 
at that moment in time, I was deciding to die alone because there was mm. no thought in my mind that I could survive this storm, that I was going to die eventually in this storm. It was just a matter of when. And when I decided not to set up the distress beacon, I'm clipping and unclipping my safety tether in this sort of suicide roulette. And I had to debate whether I was going to tell the truth about that story. When eventually a wave hits, I held the carabiner open, but the hook of the carabiner caught in my safety line and, and pulled it closed. And mm -hmm. so I remained with the boat and lived to tell the tale. But if you don't write that story, young people don't know how close you came to committing suicide. Mm -hmm. And I wanted young people to know we all, all of us have moments of doubt. And um, what I also remember very vividly is when the boat eventually got hit by the wave, did the submarine thing, eventually came back up to the surface of the water, but my head didn't come out of the water. And I remember thinking, pay attention. This is what it feels like to die. And I could watch the bubbles gathering in my hands and I could see the light. <laughs> and eventually my head said, sit up, you idiot, sit up. And I sat up, the deck was covered with water. So unless I sat up, my head wasn't going to come out of, out of the mm. water. But the first word out of my mouth was coward. And that sense of there's more. And, and you can't take a coward's way out. And, uh, so that I'll tell you what you say coward, but you could have set off this emergency position indicator radio beacon, this EPIRB has, I don't know right. if that's the right way to say it. That's right. To, that's absolutely the right way to say it. And you kept saying, I don't want to bring anybody else into this. So you had this opportunity to basically hit the panic button. I need to get out of this, but you're like, I got myself here. Why, why did you, I don't know if I would have done that. I would have like gotten my butt to the front of the boat, hit that thing. But like, was it selfless or was it selfish now that you look back? Oh, I think it was a very conscious decision that I made a choice to put myself mm -hmm. in a rowboat on the North Atlantic ocean and that I had to take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. um, I had a wonderful uh, experience of um, the Coast Guard Academy used my book as a book in common one year. And I went up to speak and the, the superintendent of the Coast Guard Academy said, I'd have pushed that button a little earlier. <laughs> and I said, but sir, I was on the other side of the ocean. Someone might've gotten hurt. Mm -hmm. And he loved that answer, but the sense of, it was an incredibly violent storm. And for me to ask someone else to come out into that storm to get me was irresponsible. Yeah. And uh, when I did finally set off my distress beacon, it was between two really violent storms in a patch of, you know, high pressure, good weather, good being relative. Uh, when the independent spirit swung by and picked me up and that night it was hit by a force 10 gale. And the captain, right after they, they picked me up, he was pretty bristly. He said, the worst kind of cargo you can have is a passenger and the worst kind of passenger you can have is a female passenger. By the end of that journey back to the, he was headed for Philadelphia. And in the sort of week we spent together, we became friends. But I think what changed his tenor was really looking at the weather maps and realizing that I may have been a fool, but I wasn't a blankety blank fool because... I didn't call anyone out into the really violent part of the storm. I called people out when it was safe for them to come. Yeah. And then also you didn't want people to see how beat up you were. You're wearing <laughs> your clothes. You're barely hanging together. I mean, I don't know the extent of your injuries, but it seems like you ruptured something in your quad, maybe your hamstring, yeah. you broke ribs yeah. and you got this full brains, whatever it is on. And then finally there was somebody that gave you a, like a Hawaiian t-shirt or a flowery t-shirt and some shorts and you come down to dinner or whatever the meal was and people yeah. just like stopped because yeah. you were that beat up. Yeah. And I, at that point was, it had, you know, I'm, when I got off the American parole, I had a long sleeve sort of, um, you know, outdoor fabric shirt, capoline and, um, some long trousers. And there weren't any other women aboard the independent spirit, except for the wife of the engineer who was terribly seasick. So I didn't meet her for days and days. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, it, you know, people sympathize for me just being in the same outfit. And eventually, uh, Captain Lawrence asked if, if I needed some underwear and I said, like, no, that's okay. I'm good. Yeah. Um, but eventually I, I met the, the engineer's wife who loaned me this 
outrageously colored shirt and a, a pair of shorts. And by that time I was feeling good. I was feeling fine and relative to when I first got off. And so I arrived at dinner with my bruises showing in full glory. And, and at that point, I mean, there was speechlessness in the room. Yeah. You said he pulled the chair out for you. Yeah. I mean, that's like in any type of, I almost say it's like a combatant environment, which you went through when you see what happens, the violence of it, your respect level for no matter what you think about the situation goes through the roof. And I just thought that was like kind of a, I don't know, as a, as a reader of the story, I'm like, okay, they finally understand because you were sucking it up. And meanwhile, you're, you're trying to, you're getting all these inbound calls from press and media. And you're probably like, this is the last thing I want to do right now. Right. And were they frustrated with you a little bit because like they had to pick you up and all this is going on? Or were they starting to realize the gravity of the situation? You know, I think the the first night it was fun for an hour or two as they realized that they were suddenly a, a media sensation. But then and and it was several flights up from where I was staying to the radio room where I would be taking these calls. And those stairs were Everest like to me every time I had to drag myself up and down those stairs. And there was a point where the boat lurched and I bumped into a wall and groaned probably for the first time in, in the hearing of the captain. And, um, it was coming up to answer a call, I think for CBS. And, um, he didn't, he didn't put any, any more calls through that night. He let me sleep, which was really very kind. Yeah. There's a human element to that, that I really just I appreciate it. I don't know. You, the way you told it was just phenomenal. And you've got four degrees. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. I was looking like you are a true scholar. Like in your journey, I'm sorry, this is kind of backtracking, but as I just think, as I process this through my head, you didn't have the advantages of like um, the education that you got until, was it junior high or high school? What, how old were you when yeah, you went to the I, I, it was school? My last. It was my last three years of uh, high school. And so I went to public schools uh, most of my life and, and not terribly good ones. Right. And I moved to Louisville, Kentucky to take, take care of a grandmother who had Alzheimer's. Mm. And uh, so I was living with this pretty, um, pretty mean old lady. Uh, but the, but the benefit was I got to go to this really extraordinary prep school and uh, Louisville collegiate school. And, you know, for a long time I dated, my life sort of before and after collegiate, the BC mm. of my life and the after collegiate of my life, because it was there that I learned to do my homework. And as you know, there's no such thing as any kind of performance if you don't learn how to do your homework. That's exactly and, right. Um, and so it was there that they really coached me up and I was so far behind my peers. We're going to take a break for just a moment to talk about how you can get exclusive content designed for high performers just like you. If you're looking for information and resources to improve your health, well-being, and performance, then sign up for my free high-performance newsletter, Adaptation. Just go to www.ericcorum.com and sign up now. This newsletter is my effort to bring zero-cost, high-performance resources and tools to anyone with a desire to improve. Now, back to the show. So do you believe in a growth mindset then? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I love to talk to young athletes and say, all right, if your coach on Tuesday tells you to run and on Wednesday, you're supposed to lift and on Thursday, you're supposed to run plays. Do you blow it all off and try to do it Friday night before the game? No, no. So don't do your, you know, if, yeah. if you get math problems on Tuesday and other things on Wednesday, you know, spread it out. Your brain is like a muscle and it can grow. Yeah. No. Cause I just, I love that. I loved how you just grew as a human being, your intellect kind of like you, now you had this playground and you had somebody that believed in you, that teacher that realized that there was some, there was some ground to be made up. And in almost every great story, there's somebody that comes along at a pivotal moment. And she seemed to be that person that was like, look, I believe in you. She could have ratted you out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She no, didn't. she could have, she could have sent me back and it was my high school history teacher. And she realized just how far behind I was and that I had like no writing experience, zero. And she was going to have to, you know, start me at second grade and, and catch me up on the mechanics of education. Mm. And she did. 
you know, she met me before school every day and was with me after school if I needed it. And yeah. I love it. I mean, I, there's just, I, if I'm just going to say right now, if you've not bought this book, you need to buy this book. It's, it's, it's one of my favorites. Now I'm going to, I've been telling my friends and family last night, I was telling my sister-in-law about how great this book was. Uh, it's just an amazing story. So you let's go back to the, um, to the, uh, to the first attempt, you get rescued. You're back in the States. You end up working with Muhammad Ali. I mean, pretty cool deal. Yeah. Can you talk about your relationship with him? What did you learn from him? And then how that led to the second attempt? Yeah, I, I was the first full-time employee of uh, what is now the Muhammad Ali Center. And it didn't exist yet. And I love working on things that don't yet exist. And he, <laughs> uh, he, he they didn't live here. At the time, they were still up in um, outside um, in Deer Park, Michigan, um, but they would be in town from time to time. And he really kind of came out of his way to kind of nudge me uh, each time he was in town in that sort of he knew as a human being, he knew where I was better than I knew where I was. There's a, there's a song in the musical um, that's based on my book that I'm still wrapping my head around, but there's a song called Drowning, which is a, an encapsulation of depression that is just so powerful. And that's where I was. I was, you know, on the mat and didn't think I could get up. And Muhammad Ali knew what that felt like and kept sort of encouraging me to get up like kid you got to get up kid you got to get up and when he knew I was ready he said you don't want to go through life as the woman who almost rode across the ocean so you know it's a pretty good excuse to have Muhammad Ali as uh, someone well I, I have to Muhammad says I have to because <laughs> I mean you had to do some you had to do some work because there were some other people gunning for this thing and you had to make up some time you had to get money yeah. you had to rebuild your boat were you scared that that boat would fail you? I was not scared the boat would fail me. Um, uh, I was scared I would fail me because uh, I still had plenty of injuries and damage from the storm. But yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't afraid of the boat. Yeah. Because you said that you had a dragon to go slay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the villain in my book is my own sense of helplessness, mm -hmm. and I think we all experience it. We call it different things, but we all have that emotion that saps us. And for me, it's seeing an injustice, seeing a wrong, seeing something that is so um, not right and not being able to fix it um, is, is still, you know, in, in my book, I seem to make peace with my helplessness. It really only lasts about 15 minutes at a time. But I think that's what life is about. It's about sort of fighting those fighting those fights, fighting those battles that need fighting, whether we're going to win them or not. In my notes, I wrote on my phone that you're a sheepdog. <laughs> you know, there's people that are sheepdogs and do you, in, in the, in the kindest sense, like that is kind of like who that's who you are. You took care of Lamar, your brother, uh, that you, you ignored yourself. It seemed, you know, like you, you were always thinking about him. You were fighting for him. You were, your back's against the wall. I'm going to fight for my brother. Then I'm going to fight this battle. I'm going to fight. I'm going to go fight for these people on the streets right. in Boston. I'm going to go fight for these people in the hospital. I want the toughest assignment because I'm going to go take care of them. And actually you said in your book, now I'm remembering this, like when you're thinking about dying, you were like, you know, I kind of thought that if I did this, I could serve in a higher way. I don't want to say that's your why, but you said it in the book. Yeah. And I do think that's true. I, you know, there's no way I'd be a university president if I hadn't rowed a boat across the ocean. It's a very strange way to become a university president. <laughs> and I, and I choose to be president at a place like Spalding University in urban Louisville, Kentucky, you know, a mile from the Breonna Taylor riots, protests, um, mostly protests. Mm. Um, uh, and it's in the heart of our campus and serving students who aren't privileged mm. and can't get an education just anywhere. And, and I want to be here. We've got graduate schools at Spalding that could rank among the best graduate schools in the country, but our undergraduate program is, is a little scrappy. And I, and I want to fight for those students and I want them to have the kind of experience I had when teachers believed in me. Yeah. Mm. I love your heart. You've got such a great heart. That is a, 
I'm and I'm I'm so glad that you're fighting for other people and you're continuing to do this. Like it doesn't stop. You slayed one dragon, you go to the <laughs> next one, you go to the next one, you go to the next one. Um with that said, I have I have a couple more questions for you. In your book, and you even said this at the beginning of the uh of the podcast today, you talked about how when you were at Harvard, they did all these studies, like these psychological evaluations, and you are a introvert. And Big time. and that was to your advantage on the boat because yeah. you love solace. It also was, you know, it, it also also like when you went back to the world uh, of like the urban world, like it was traumatic. But you said you were frightened at a cocktail party, but you're good on the ocean. How have you become comfortable as president of a university? Yeah, I feel like I took a wrong turn somewhere. Um, <laughs> you know, there are lots of. Um, introverts who end up in leadership. And um, I don't, it's really just how we recharge. That's the challenge. I've got to have my alone time. And typically it happens in um, the basement of my house. I married into this ginormous house um, when I married Mac McClure. And uh, he kind of owned the first floor and the second floor, kind of the living spaces of the house. And I took over the basement and the basement is my workshop. And I build things and make things. And as I'm building and making things, I'm that's my reflective time because presidents don't have a lot of time for reflection. And I do think that's important for all of us to sort of make sense of our lives and make sense of our missions and make sense of our own personal commandments, whatever they might be. Um, we need we need that time. Now, the other benefit of being an introvert is I don't I don't need a lot of attention. So. So what I care about is not necessarily bringing attention to me. It's I, I've got to get better at bringing attention to the university. I don't brag enough about what good work we do. Um, and the experience I had this summer of, of watching this amazing musical row sort of broke me open in a way that made me realize how in leadership today, at this moment in time, power and privilege are seen as evil things. And so leaders, we try to make ourselves as small as possible, particularly if we're not sort of in that class of sort of the traditional white male who can lean into that privilege and just tell people what to do. We end up being smaller than is really beneficial to our teams or institutions. And we've got to give ourselves permission to use the power and privilege for good Mm -hmm. um, rather than to just pretend we don't have it. Because yeah. this is a this this story gives you a platform to shine light on things that you want to shine light on, and uh, I th- I'm look if 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 Spalding University has any part of the heart that you have, this is a place you want to send your kids to. Yes. So um, I'm I'm so thankful that you're doing the work that you're doing, um, and that you've taken time for us today. I always ask our guests three questions um, at the end. What does high performance mean to you? <laughs> so so uh, uh, high performance for me means immorta- immortality. Um, Never heard and, this one. Let's go. <laughs> you know, when we're young, high performance is about being bigger and smarter and stronger and faster. And, and, it, and high performance is about an individual and what an individual can, can be and do. As we grow older, it's, you know, what we can inspire people around us as teams to do. Um, but I think the, 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 the sort of the folks behind me that have some sense of immortality are folks who really call us to dream bigger dreams and to um, the folks who, you know, the, the, the sort of aha moment I had yesterday kind of looking at my own bookshelf is 90% of those books behind me are by dead white guys because that's the classical education that most of us still get. And the books by women are like, you know, okay, it's Elizabeth the first or it's Joan of Arc or um, the, you know, it's Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman. It's folks who really came up from nothing um, to, to leave a mark. And that sense of high performance being, you know, for women, typically our, our immortality is through our children and, and it should be for both men and women, <laughs> that sense of our children being a part of our future. But it's also what we create, what we build, 
the the sense of things that we leave behind, our our personal sense of justice and trying to create peace in the world um, is is what high performance is about. I love that because one day somebody's going to be in a really tough spot and they're going to be quoting in their head your book. (laughs) <laughs> and that that's truly what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? That like, I, I believe is that it's living on your work as a legacy. Um, and that's a spectacular response. I have not heard that. Well, the, um, I think I told you that the book had its own hurricanes. Yes. <laughs> it came out in 2008. Of course, the great recession, it was slated to be the lead book for the Harper Collins, the Collins imprint of Harper Collins, a major publishing house. Yes. A major imprint. The Collins imprint printed the King James Bible. Arguably, I had the editors for God, right? This was good. It was going to be the lead book for the spring, get all kinds of marketing. And then uh, the Collins imprint was closed in February of, of 2008. And my book was due out in April. So it went to the basement. Then uh, Oprah Winfrey's team picked the book to be uh, a summer read and and Harper Collins wouldn't give them any books. So that didn't work out so well. And then, and I didn't know until maybe quite recently that um, this happens to books that don't fit the normal paradigms. My book was misclassified. It's a memoir about a woman rowing a boat alone across the ocean. Okay. So it got classified as a nautical book. And so with like books on how to steer a boat and books on how to tie a knot and in places like Kentucky, it got shelved in transportation. That's a shame. Planes, trains, automobiles, woman alone in a rowboat. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it shows up in sports. Also kind of weird, football, basketball, woman alone in a rowboat. Um, and so if, if, if the publishing world doesn't know how to classify it, it gets really buried. That's messed up. I mean, the, the front of the book, Washington Post, a rip-roaring adventure tale. I mean, this is, this is a piece of art. I mean, it really is a class to me it's going to become a classical piece of literature um and you wrote it in that such a like i you have a master's in what fine arts of writing i mean one of your four amazing degrees <laughs> um this is a wonderful book everybody should buy this and read it and keep it and give it to somebody else um what habits or practices have you adopted to consistently help you perform at your best i mean cuz you you have to be on your A game as the president of the university. How yeah, do you so, keep that up? You know, they're like, I'm, I'm a, a long, you know, many decades athlete. So we've got to keep moving. If we stop moving, we're going to rust into immobility. Uh, so I still row and I still, um, I cross country ski on wheels on roller skis in the park. But I think going back to that sense of high performing teams there's a there's a list of phrases from um, the Gallup Strengths, and it's um, build trust, show compassion, provide stability, create hope. And whenever I'm struggling with what to do next, I, I go back to those four things. Building trust. If you don't have trust among your teammates or your colleagues, you, you don't have much at all. And showing compassion. Compassion is one of my favorite word, words to the um, Latin uh, um, base for passion is pati, which means suffering, which you're passionate about, you're willing to suffer for. Mm -hmm. And the prefix calm means with the willingness to suffer with another. And so much of sport, so much of education, so much of all the endeavors in life that are important are about you know, really suffering for something that is good and, and trying to bring about good in the world. Provide stability is not my strong suit. I like to rock the boat. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I need other people around me who will provide stability because that's just not what I'm going to do. And then creating hope, I think, is essential for everybody. Gosh, you have a way with words. Um, what are you doing right now to invest in your personal growth? You know, I um, one of my favorite things is to is to build stuff for other people. I, I This uh, computer is sitting on a desk that I just finished building maybe a, a, a week and a half ago. And uh, I wish I could show it to you, but it would involve rattling the camera. Yeah. <laughs> and I like to, um, I, I, I'm building leather briefcases for friends. Uh, no way. Yeah. The, the woman who played uh, Tori in the musical row is a woman named Grace McLean, a fantastic actor. Someone asked what it's like having 
you know, watching a musical about yourself. I said, it's a little like being stripped naked in public. The good, the good news is I'm a 30 something redhead with a great body and amazing talent. So it's not all bad. That's so um, but but I'm, I just made a briefcase for Grace and uh, sent it off yesterday. Yeah. You are amazing. How can people find and support you or support the work that you're doing? So Spalding University, Louisville, Kentucky, um, spalding.edu. I'm not hard to find. And people need to buy A Pearl in the Storm. <laughs> like, go to Amazon and get this book. President McClure, it was amazing having you on. Thank you so much for taking time for us today. Well, it was really fun for me. And thanks for what you're doing. And, and keep helping all of us to live a little better each day. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I think you should check out episode 30 with Michelle DeJulius. Her story of working as an undercover police officer with the Baltimore Police Department and facing fear and overcoming adversity for others is a timely message for everyone. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all of our other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home online at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.